South Africa's deep apartheid divides, Myrtle Witboy's first organizing work took place in private homes. At an early age, she saw the impact of injustice without representation. In 1967, South Africa was still in the grip of apartheid and domestic workers was actually just depending on women. And because women were majority black women, uneducated, we found ourselves as domestic workers. She began to organize domestic workers in her employer's garage, an act of resistance worthy of imprisonment at the time. Her voice became one of the first public figures to campaign for the rights for this isolated group of women workers. Myrtle organized South Africa's National Union of Domestic Workers, the largest movement of its kind. Make sure that domestic workers are included in your decisions making in your country. Make sure that domestic workers get recognition that their work is decent work. In the new democracy, she posed hard questions to government leaders. Who ironed their shirt that day? Who looked after their children? Who cleaned their homes? Challenges that led to the adoption of five national labor laws, including unemployment insurance and maternity benefits. In 2008, Myrtle's impact multiplied as she became the president of the first international organization of domestic workers, which played a powerful role in achieving the only global policy for domestic workers, the International Labour Organization's Convention 189, now ratified by 35 countries. Under the global COVID crisis, she led an international process
امان لا امان لا thank you very much thank you take your seats There's no better way that Myrtle would love to have been brought into her own funeral than this. Take your seats, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Wayne Johnson, and I will be guiding you through the service today. For many of you who know Myrtle as the great organizer, I want you to know that she organized her own funeral. Everything you will hear today, everything that will be said in the order that has been said, is something Myrtle wanted. And she said something at the end of that order for the program. She said, do not cry. But if you want to cry today, feel free. If you want to shout, if you want to cheer, feel free. Before I continue with the welcome, on behalf of Linda and myself, we want to thank and show our eternal gratefulness to Jackie and Peter for what you have done for your mother up to the very last moment of her life on this earth is indescribable. The highest example of honor children can show their mother. And I feel compelled and I would like you to join me as I give them and applause for their great work. <laughs> to Peter, Jackie, Linda, Caleb, Mia, this moment in our lives is a very special one and an important one, where together with so many other people, we gather to say farewell to the most amazing woman you had the privilege to call mommy and granny. To Joseph, Uncle Joseph, Uncle Vivian, Uncle Brian, Myrtle's remaining siblings, welcome to you and your families, and also the children of the late Jessica Phelps, Myrtle's youngest sister. Your presence here today is very comforting. A very warm welcome to all the family and friends that have traveled from far and near to honor this exceptional human being. We have people from Myrtle's hometown. Yeah, can we hear you? Yes, the people from Granadinal. She is the daughter of the Valley of Grace. We have people from all parts of South Africa. We have people from Mitchell's Plain, where she lived for many years. And we have people here who traveled by plane from all over the world. Jennifer, Tim, Elizabeth, Geraldine, Shirley, Vicky, Daniel, Nelly, Dure, Doug, to name a few, who came here especially to honor this amazing woman and to share in our celebration, our sadness, and the privilege to honor and pay tribute to a mother, our leader, our friend, and a true icon. I want to channel a little bit of my inner myrtle. And I imagine she would say, Heroes don't wear capes and use their powers to clean your drapes. Heroes do not wear masks to complete the important tasks. No, the real heroines are the mothers and daughters you invite into your homes to take care of you and your families. And so, to honor the passion and mission that was Myrtle's life, and for those who together with her have fought tirelessly for dignity and equal rights nationally and globally to the loyal and loving members of Satsawu, Kosato, and IDWF who have traveled from far and near to be here, I say welcome and amanla. If you are here today and you've not been included in the list of people I've welcomed, I want to say a warm welcome to you. Today, you are going to listen 
to tributes, stories, and messages that will either make you so happy that you had the privilege to meet this amazing woman, or it's going to make you so sad that you never had the chance to meet her for real. But it's going to be special. A special welcome to those who are watching us from all over the world at this moment. There are so many people who wish they could be here to share in this moment. And we are live streaming this service and this tribute uh, ceremony. And we want to say welcome to them. And we'd like to express and acknowledge your presence with us today. The program that you have and Myrtle won't be offended by it too much, has changed a little bit. We've added some things. And after the opening prayer, Mia and Caleb will come forward and do the scripture reading. And following the sermonette, we will have the committal service right here in the front, as there won't be any procession to the crematorium. For now, I invite you to stand as we together sing one of Myrtle's favorite hymns, How Great Thou art. Shall we stand?
Let us bow our heads for prayer. Dear Father, we gather here in your name <clears throat> to thank you for the life of sacrifice, of courage, and blessing to society by our dear sister Myrtle Woodboy. We thank you for her dedicated life. We thank you that she could serve and uplift so many lives, so many pilgrims on the journey of life. And as we spend this morning reviewing her life, remembering the challenges she faced and the progress made in relieving stressful situations, we just want to praise your name for giving her the courage and the fortitude to carry out the task. We pray, Lord, that today when we leave this chapel, after we have listened to the many tributes, may we all determine in our hearts to join the struggle for right, doing whatever is in our power, in our small way, to build up society and making a positive contribution to our country wherever we find ourselves. We pray that this service may bring honor and glory to your name. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41, verse 10. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you, as a father carries his son, all the way you went until you reached this place. Deuteronomy 1, verse 31. I don't know if you noticed when you came in that the place where the coffin was for you to view had very powerful words. Did you notice them? Which is so fitting for Myrtle's life. Make a difference so others may live. Just one or two extra welcome messages. We have also paying her respects, Dr. Debbie Raputi, Ambassador Dr. Debbie Raputi from the World Woman Leading Change who came today to pay her respects as well. Also, while we, while we are here to speak and give honor for someone who has passed away, our pastor is also celebrating his 70th birthday today. So happy birthday to you. I've been asked to say a eulogy on behalf of the family, but I ask myself the question, how do you distill a lifetime of memories into a few moments? It's almost an injustice. While it is an honor to hold the responsibility of eulogizing Myrtle Ruth Deline Witboy, it is a challenge to fit everything you want to say into one speech. And it is for this reason that we have invited different people from different perspectives of Myrtle's life to share their stories. And I would like to start by setting the scene. For more than half my life, I have known Myrtle first as Mrs. Witboy, then as Auntie Myrtle, then as my second mother, and finally as Granny to my two sons and also to Mia. 
But I've also discovered and I realized that she is known as something else to many others. She is known as a revolutionary, a giant, a fighter for justice, a legend, a champion for change, a true feminist, a great warrior, exceptional leader, organizer, and comrade. But she was also a loving mother and a doting grandmother. We had conversations with her grandchildren that were unknown for grandmother and grandkids to have, but something I know my boys will never forget. To me, she was not only my mother-in-law, but she was also my hero. The first time I really met her was in 1994, where she was the leader of one of the voting stations in Mitchell's Plain during the first democratic election. And I worked there together with Linda. I was very impressed with her and what she stood for. And at that stage, I had known very little of the struggle she was really in. But throughout the years of getting to know her and spending so much time with her, she challenged and inspired me in so many ways. And thinking about these moments, I want to share a few of them with three quotes that I found very powerful. And these quotes are now immortalized in the special obituary written by Jennifer Fish. Her pursuit for freedom and equality and dignity for all people, especially women and domestic workers, I can tell you, was a sight to behold. She was relentless in a quest and was willing to give up so much for others. And even after we got our freedom in 1994, she never stopped her fight for freedom and equality. Her first quote I like, she said, we wanted freedom, but it was not going to be given to us on a golden platter. Another thing that really inspired me and impressed me, impressed me was while I was persistent in my pursuit for education, she showed me that you don't have to be the most educated person to make a difference in this world. The power of your knowledge or the acquisition of your knowledge is not only to increase yourself, but to make the lives of others better. She said, don't let your education stop you for what you believe in. And I love the second quote. I got my degree in the kitchen. We often teased each other, and Jackie and Peter and Linda know, we often teased each other about the many countries we have traveled to, and we had a little competition to see who had been to more countries. And while we were very close in our competition and our contest, I lost hopelessly when comparing to the impact such visits make. Listening to the many messages from all over the world, I am humbled, astonished, amazed, and moved by the impact she made and how she influenced and shaped so many people's lives and movements. I mean, how many of you here today can boast that you managed to get 35 countries to ratify a convention to protect the rights of workers? It is at that moment I knew I lost hopelessly. Speaking to Jackie and Linda and Peter and asking them to say and share something special about your mother that I could say. It was difficult for them because they said, there's not one thing we can say. There's so many things that they can share. But I will share what they, what they said to me that they would like me also possibly to share with you. Linda said her fondest memory of a mother that she was a larger than life figure. She was the epitome, and these were Linda's words, bravery passion, tenacity, courage, and persistence. And while she was a single mother raising three kids, Linda said, I never felt like anything was missing in my life. And that is exactly how she strives to raise her own boys. Peter said for him, it was the fact, and this is the part of, of Myrtle's life, is that she speaks her mind. There's no time to dry dukis. You will hear it the way she wants you to hear it. And that was the power of her voice.
for Jackie, who spent almost well, her whole life up to now with her mother, she said the last four years was very special because she worked very closely with her mother. And she said the one thing she saw was the fact that she was willing to give up everything for others. She put everyone else before herself. And this has had a tremendous impact on her own life to the extent that this is something that she also does very naturally. I love in Jennifer's obituary, there is a, a, a statement she makes. She says, I will continue fighting for domestic workers' rights every day of my life. And I can tell you, the last time I saw her was on the 7th of January. Up to that last moment, she was still concerned about the workers' rights. There are so many things that have been said about her on social media. And if you look in social media and if you go through the pages on her Facebook page, you will not realize what, you will realize what an amazing woman she was. And I want to share a few of them. These messages, all these messages are so special, but I just want to share a few of them. The message from Just Associates says, we fondly remember her commitment to freedom, her laughter, her energy, her constant solidarity, our work in Southern Africa to globally, her work, passion, hope, and love to always fight for justice will continue to live with us and our work. Comrade Myrtle, you are forever in our hearts, and we will continue to build from what you so passionately committed your life to. The Association of Domestic Workers says, your departure leaves us with so much pain and sadness, but we will continue your legacy fighting for the labor and human rights of domestic workers all over the world. We will for never forget you. Rest in peace, and I love this part, warrior of a thousand battles. Alison Thompson says, you have shaped my life and domestic workers movement globally. You will, never, you will forever be missed and we will continue your fight. We even had messages in other languages which I had to translate in, in, into English. And Sohela from the Netherlands wrote this in Dutch but I will read it to you in English. The strength this woman had herself and then transmitted to others is beyond words. Adriana Ramirez says, the soul and heart of the global domestic workers movement has left this realm. A brave and luminous spirit is immortal. You are always with us in every training, rally, march, and meetings we do with domestic workers and leaders worldwide. It is your time to rest. You have changed the world and it will never be the same because of you. And the last quote I want to share is from Fatima. She says, Hamburg Ashley, Auntie Myrtle, you have done more in your lifetime to advance the rights of domestic workers in South Africa and globally, more than most of us could ever hope to do in multiple lifetimes. Our world is now poor for your departure. My Auntie M, it moi food for us. She left wonderful footprints for us to follow in. And that's her favorite poem, Footprints in the Sand. Thank you for the inspiration and role model to us. Reading these messages gives us peace and comfort in the sad time. And I want to end this eulogy with, I think will become an immortal quote that epitomizes Myrtle Witboy. I want you to remember me, unite and organize. I want you to remember, and this is for you now and for me, I want you to remember, if I can do it, you can do it. And together we can sing Amandla. Most times people say, rest in peace. But I was so impressed by all the messages because of the woman Myrtle was and will remain in our hearts. Everyone says, rest in power. Many of us want to have the mission that we leave this world a better place than when we have found it. 
And the message for you today is clear from Myrtle. If I can do it, you can do it. Long live the memory of Myrtle. Viva! I want to invite a very special man who wrote a very special poem about Myrtle. Poet, English professor, Tim Sibilis. It's a real honor to be here. Myrtle changed the world with her words and the power of her loving spirit. And these are the things that affected me when I was, was lucky enough to meet her and spend time with her. And so this is a poem that I actually got to read to her in August. I was in Cape Town in August. And I got to read the piece to her. And uh, it's a poem in her voice um, as, I, as I hear her speak still in my head. And the poem is simply uh, called Myrtle Vidboy. I say over and over the same things. Sure, domestic workers are people. How do you? not see us. You think we don't have husbands, sons, daughters? You think our parents don't want us home for Christmas? You think we do this dirty work because we have nothing better to do? Shame. We take your children to the park. Our children like the park. They need sunshine, too. But we are not with our children. We are in your house, so you can go to work, to the beach, fly around the world, and come home to polished floors, pressed clothes, hot food, and forks that shine, like we don't have anything else to live for. Sure. We have friends to visit, books to read. Domestic workers want time for their own lives. We are not washing machines or cooking machines. We are people with hopes and hard questions, people who want a few nice things. You say we're part of the family, then maybe you come clean up my house next Tuesday, so I can sit somewhere with a coffee, maybe get my hair done. I like the beach. I like to see the little fish scoot, feel the waves splash my feet. Sure. You think I don't get tired of these heavy shoes? Amandla. Thank you very much, Tim, for that powerful poem. We're going to have the first group of tributes. Each speaker will speak a maximum of five minutes. Please stick to your, your time limit. If you finish before that, that's also OK. First, we're going to have Tina Corneli, a regional manager of FOS and one of uh, the big donors for Satsawu. Then we'll have a friend and colleague, Salim Patel, and then speaking on behalf of Myrtle's family, Nina Ricks. Then we'll have a lifelong friend and struggle partner, Hester Stevens. And the last speaker will be Fairuz Mulaji. Tina. Hello, everyone. Um, like Wayne said, my name is Tina Corneli. But for Myrtle and Myrtle's friends and family, I'm called Tiny. <laughs> Tiny Tina, she called me. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, I'm uh, from Foss and I've been with, I knew Myrtle since 2018, although it seems like much longer. Um, when I was asked to speak, uh, I was instantly nervous because what do you say about a giant like Myrtle? And what do we say that people don't know yet? Because everybody knows how amazing Myrtle was, how much she achieved, what a hero she was. But surprisingly, she didn't really know herself for very long yet. When she was diagnosed with cancer in August, she got messages from all over the world, like Wayne was saying, messages of support, messages telling her what she had meant to them, how she impacted their life. And she was so shocked. When I visited her in September, she said, Tiny, I never knew I made such an impact on people. I'm so shocked. And I was equally shocked, like, how can you not know? Like, we all know, how can you not know? Like, but she was genuinely shocked. And that, for me, shows the kind of person she was, next to being a giant and a hero. She was so humble. She was extremely humble. And also, she had a heart so big. I also could never understand, she, she's this giant woman. She travels the world, she speaks at uh, everywhere, internationally, but she still had time for people. She still cared so much. Um, like, we, we were talking on WhatsApp, like, daily, weekly, and the messages, she would care about my life, she would care, we talked about Satsau, of course, a lot, but also about her personal lives, and she would give me advice, like in 2020, when I went to Zimbabwe after COVID, well, during COVID, after COVID, she sent me several messages over days like, Tiny, please don't do it. It's not safe now. Think of your family. And, and I'm like, where does she have the time to do all of this? But that is Myrtle. Her heart is so big and she can absorb everybody. <laughs> I don't know. So, yeah, that was Myrtle for me. Myrtle, in your last message to me, you asked me, like, my time is running out. Please take care of Satsau for me. And we'll do that together with Jackie, together with even Peter and Linda. I'm sure they'll get involved. Together with the strong and beautiful team of Satsau, we'll definitely continue your legacy. And on days that we feel a bit sad or we don't have courage, we'll just think of your look your typical myrtle look and we'll just quickly carry on <laughs> or we'll think of your flick of the eye you always used to give us and we'll just carry on um, carry on your legacy you'll always be in my heart thank you Good morning, everybody. Amandla. Viva, Comrade Myrtle. Viva. Viva. Comrade Myrtle. We spent many hours together over the years in conversations that went on, you know, endlessly. We shared a passion. It was a passion for organization building, organizational strategies. And we could agree and disagree over and over again. Our agreements were more heated than our disagreements. But in these conversations, she often stopped and she asked, how are your two boys doing? And I would obviously complain and share all my worries with her. And she advised, just be patient and love them. She spoke about her family with admiration. You know, her daughters, her son, her son-in-law, her grandchildren. I got to know her in between these discussions. I got to know you in between these discussions. You did her proud. And we owe you a thousand things for sharing her with us, with the world. She was an internationalist. 
Now, 20 years ago, when I started working with Myrtle on various projects on building organization, she, I used to call her Auntie, Auntie Myrtle. And she used to correct me politely to Comrade Myrtle. And, but, you know, out of respect and with habit, I just continued to call her Auntie. And she said, you know, patiently again, corrected me. After a little while, she just said, Salim, I will not continue the conversation if you do not call me Comrade Myrtle, or simply Myrtle. It uh, took me a while to realize she was trying to cultivate a relationship where we could be open, not scared of each other or, or worried we will, you know, insult each other or make each other feel bad. She wanted criticism, and she wanted to be able to criticize and have that kind of discussion, a strategic discussion. And, um, and that led to, as I said, countless hours. Um, and she often told me, you are wrong. Your idea is not practical. You know? And yes, it helped me. It helped me take you know, raw, immature ideas and turn them into programs. She made me a better person. She made thousands of us better people. And she didn't want any accolades. She wasn't one for that. She was simply in the struggle for justice, for equality, for freedom. Now, I was privileged to have two long conversations with her in the past month, just like we used to have when I was sitting in her office. And I want to share that with you very briefly. The, in the conversation, she stopped, she paused, and she said, Salim, you must continue to regularly visit Satsao office. Be there for them, support them. Satsao will hold me to it. The second time, she told me, or she, the second one was actually a question. I mean, obviously, she was not one to think that apartheid is better than what we have now. No. Nope. But I was still processing, and I flippantly answered, well, we are better off without them. She explained to me, Salim, I'm weaker. I'm not eating. When I take a few steps, I get tired. But my mind is working. It is 100% clear. In other words, think about what I'm saying. How did we build unity? How did we accomplish so many things under a white government? Things we can't do today. How unity today? That is what she was asking. I don't have the answer. I'm sharing it with you so that collectively we can develop that and honor her memory. A better world. And it's so difficult for me to say goodbye. Hambakash le Comrade Myrtle. I will still have those conversations with you every day. Viva Comrade Myrtle, viva. Yeah. Greetings to all in the wonderful name of Jesus. On behalf of the Foti and the Breton family, we too would like to honor and celebrate our sister and aunt, Myrtle Whitboy. A little closer. It is said that grief is the price you pay for love. And wow, did Auntie Myrtle personify and embody love. Loss has a unique way of reminding us about the brevity of life. Time is precious, but it is also limited. And when reflecting on the life of Auntie Myrtle, 
we stand in awe of how much life, love, compassion, and contribution she packed into the limited time she spent with us. As the family, we were recipients of this love and compassion. I think of the annual year-end gatherings. Those moments will be treasured as she made each of us feel so special with her motherly love. She also took a keen interest in her nephews and nieces, and even though she traveled frequently, she would always ensure she made time to see her brothers for a catch-up. To the females in the family, she represented strength and a never-give-up attitude despite any diverse adversity being faced. Auntie Myrtle had this gift of speaking truth in love. In other words, Sia Dung did us. <laughs> the past week, we were immensely proud, reading and hearing the tributes that came from far and near. And it is clear that Auntie Myrtle left a rich legacy that we would do well to emulate. We will miss her positive energy, love, care, and presence. And we are so grateful that we were around to witness her many achievements. Auntie Myrtle, you ran your race and fought the good fight until the very end. I'm sure you will be greeted in heaven with the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. We love you. To our cousins, thank you for sharing your mother with not only us, but with so many others. We have your back, just as you have had ours in all those trying times. We, your family, love you. And we wish you strength and healing in this time. Thank you. I'm a unionist, I'm a unionist, I'm a unionist. My mother was a kitchen girl, my father was a garden boy, that's why. I'm a unionist, I'm a unionist, I'm a unionist, that's why. I'm a unionist. Yeah, first and foremost, I would like to say my, my condolences to the Whitboy family, Joseph and Brian and them. I want to say, and I stand here today with a broken heart. I'm like a broken glass here today because Myrtle was always by my side. I met Myrtle in 1985. And then I joined the trade union where Myrtle was trying to pick up the pieces and bring the workers together and form a trade union for domestic workers. 1986, I remember, then we merged and called all the provinces and each province come with their own flag. And then we formed the trade union SADWU at UWC. I remember the time when I became a member of the union. Myrtle was always on my toe because Myrtle was the one who's grooming me to be part of the leadership, to become a president of the South African Domestic Service and Allied Workers Union. Myrtle is a warrior. Myrtle is my friend. Myrtle is my sister. Myrtle is everything in my life. I used to go to Myrtle's house when I was working in Bishop's Court. And as I came from home, I feel lonely. Myrtle was always the one 
amongst all of them, who say to me, Hester, come to my house. I remember when Peter, Jackie, and Linda were small. I used to go there every Friday evening. Then we used to meet each other at the town center so that Myrtle can go and do shopping for the weekend. We used to go to the seven-day church in Mitchell's Plain. We go on a Sabbath morning, and then when we came back, lunchtime, and then when it's the Sabbath need to be closed, then Myrtle will read to us about the book of the law. Myrtle is somebody that I cannot describe. I, the other night, I was lying in my bed, and I couldn't sleep. I asked God this morning to make me strong, because I want to talk about Myrtle. Myrtle play a big role in my life, in my life as a woman, as a mother, and as a comrade. Myrtle teach me how to speak. Myrtle teach me how to deal with the labor laws of this country, is to represent workers. I remember when me and Myrtle was attending the ILO, and that was my first time in history that I went to the highest decision-making body, the labor laws of the country in Geneva, where Myrtle put me on a, on a, on a, uh, on a plenary where I have to go through a test as to how to speak when I'm on the platform. We went through that. Myrtle played a very important role in the ILO. For me as a worker, I was looking up to Myrtle for the courage, the, 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 the love, and the passion that Myrtle had. Myrtle represent the most vulnerable workers in South Africa. Today, we as a SAU, we, our hearts are bleeding because we lost a, a, a comrade. Myrtle was living for the domestic workers in this country, and Myrtle had a heart of gold. Jackie, Peter, and Linda, you lost a mother, you lost a warrior. Myrtle was well known. I remember when we went to Uruguay for the IDWF conference, where Comrade Bicke, all the leadership here, Shirley and them, when we were there, and then they said, we want Myrtle to become the president of the IDWF nationally, that Myrtle will be around the world all the time. God give Myrtle that grace. God give Myrtle that power that Myrtle could make it. Myrtle will never be in a country if she say to me, Esther, I'm here, and that the meetings that she was attending. I must say that for the IDWF, we feel proud as Satsau to be part of you. We feel proud to be affiliated to you. And today, we as comrades, we can stand together and take hands. Myrtle will be missed. Myrtle will be missed by me. It was the world road that we walk. Me and Myrtle, if there was something worrying me, Myrtle was always the, sh the shoulder that I could cry on if the, darks, the days are dark in my life. Myrtle will never be forgotten. It's right in my heart that I will remember Myrtle. It's sad to lose Myrtle. Myrtle used to send, uh, while she was sick, every morning the message come through, how are you, Esther, and fine, and I. But recently, I think it's a time when Myrtle went completely down, is that uh, she stopped with her messages in the morning, and then I said, I wonder what is wrong, that because Myrtle is very quiet, and then that it was a time that meet Myrtle, is on a way to, to, need, to, to meet the uh, Lord. God is our savior. God will guide us in the way. We also have the hope and we will pray and we will trust. And those uh, uh, comrades who always help us in the, in the trade union movement with the education, uh, technology and everything, comrade uh, fairies on them, they will still then work with us. I want to say to my comrades from Cape Town 
It's an honor and a privilege to have Myrtle. Myrtle was like the steering wheel. If we need something, Myrtle is the first person who will say, I will make a plan. I will try to find a solution. And today, I ask God again to make me strong because I want to speak on Myrtle. Myrtle was more than a sister to me. I will remember and I will treasure Myrtle until God comes and take me away. Thank you. everyone. Condolences to the family and the entire domestic work fraternity. Myrtle, you were our rock. We salute you for your courage, commitment, and resilience. The UWC, SLP, the Social Law Project, we were incorporated into a new center but Myrtle refused to accept that. She said, I know you as Social Law Project and I will continue to work with you as the Social Law Project. UWC has had a long relationship with Myrtle, which spanned way before my time. I've had several conversations when Jackie asked me to speak. In fact, she called me to remind me, and I think I was in denial. I couldn't accept it. I'm not much of a public speaker, and I was so shocked when, when Jackie called me. But I knew in my heart that is what Myrtle wanted. And so I'm here having this conversation with you, Myrtle, the last conversation which I couldn't have with you. When I w first walked into your office, at Satsau in January 2009 to inform you about the research we were about to conduct, looking at the impact of legislation on the lives of domestic workers. What you said to me changed, you know, I consider myself a knowledge worker. And what you said to me after I introduced myself and the work we were about to do, you said to me, are you going to be one of those researchers who come and knock at our door, pick our brains, write your books and theses, and then we never hear from you again? I am here with you, Myrtle. We've walked this journey together since then. I invited you onto the advisory panel. You agreed, and the rest is history. ILO Convention 189, 2010 and 2011. You were on the center stage of the world making laws for domestic workers, not only in this country, but across the world. And we were there with you. The Compensation for Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act. We walked this road with you for more than 10 years advocating for inclusion of domestic workers under that law. And these things don't happen overnight. And it took the courage, conviction, and resilience that you shared. There was much we did. You would pick up the phone and say, Fairuz, we need to talk. Or I would say, comrade, we need to talk about anything. And as Salim said, we had agreements, we had disagreements, but we shared a common interest 
in social justice for vulnerable workers, especially domestic workers. In the last three years, we focused on building the We Care platform, which we initiated and got your blessing for. A platform for domestic workers, by domestic workers, for domestic workers. You proudly watched the graduation ceremony of the first group of workers empowered with digital tools. Your pre-recorded message of support will give us the strength to persevere. We bid farewell to you today, but your legacy will live on, and we, as UWC, commit to continue on our path of co-creation of knowledge for a better and just world. Go well, comrade. At this time, we'd like to invite Geraldine to come and deliver a special song together and accompanied by Amne and Aaron. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. It's one of Myrtle's favorite songs. We're going to have the next round of tributes. And I hope this stays on. We're going to invite in this order the following speakers to come to the front and share their tribute. Elizabeth Tang, the General Secretary of the IDWF. Vicky Kanyorka, Shirley Price, Doug Moore, and last in this group will be Gloria Kente, who is an organizer of Satsawa and also a friend of Myrtle. And all of them are friends of Myrtle. Elizabeth. As the General Secretary of the International Domestic Workers Federation, the IDWF, I'm the right-hand person of the organization and I'm the right-hand person of Myrtle. I remember two weeks ago when I came here to talk with Myrtle, one of the last things she said to me was, Elizabeth, you have done a good job. I was quiet, but deep in my heart, I had a lot to say to her, especially how I felt I could be the one who have done a good job in her eyes. I felt myself, and I believe, knowing so many union leaders globally, I'm actually one of the luckiest, luckiest trade union general secretary because I have a very strong and very supportive president, Berto. When I say this, I don't mean she always clap her hand on everything I said or everything I did. No. Sometimes, she was really angry with me. And I also got angry with her. And then, we didn't talk to each other, we didn't WhatsApp each other for two weeks. <laughs> so you know how it is like. But of course, after that, you know, one of us, sometimes it's her, sometimes it's me, we start again, calling each other, WhatsApping each other. But one thing I really appreciate very much is that she always said what she didn't like about me, what she liked about me directly. And, and in most cases, I agree with what she said. So that is how I, I got support and how I move on. Indeed, we are a good team. We complemented each other very well. You all know her, she is such a great speaker, and I'm not. And I feel very good about this, because when I was with her, I didn't have to think about speaking in the public. So she book, she inspired people, she mobilized people, she, she reminded people where's the light at the end of the tunnel? And I got the job done. So that's how we have been together in the last 10 years. And even more because we started before the IDWF was formed. We worked together in the last one year to form the IDWF. So to me, from Monday onwards when she was gone, IDWF, it's not the same to me. As we have heard from Wayne earlier, many internationally felt the same way. And I just want to add that there are so many messages probably you don't know because they are written in other languages. 
And we also have got condolence messages, and I want the family in particular to know that also from um, um, high-level people, uh, such as the director of the ILO aircraft, uh, the director of the ILO in Asia, I don't know why Asia, <laughs> and from the, from the IUF, the general secretary of the IUF, the general secretary of the ITUC, and uh, yeah, and also many of our funders, the FNV, uh, the OPIC, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I have traveled, uh, worked together with Myrtle for you know, all these years and we have been in so many countries uh, from Hong Kong to Korea to Brazil to, um, yeah, Belgium, et cetera, et cetera. And in the last uh, six months, I've been uh, reading all the messages, you know, from the workers in all these countries, you know, s giving their well wishes and, uh, and their thoughts about Myrtle. And, 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 and when I met Myrtle last time, she, she said, why? Why, why they said this to me? How, what, what, did I, what did I do uh, you know, to make them feel uh, I, w I was important to them? And uh, yeah, so I just said, Berto, you can play magic. <laughs> the final thing I want to say is, uh, is is uh, something between us uh, personal. She has been holding me tight when political suppression fell on my family. My husband is in jail for his uh, political activism in Hong Kong. And Myrtle had always, always Ask me about him in jail. And until we met last, the two weeks ago, she was still angry that there's nothing people can do more to get him released. Of course, it's difficult to explain, but because she kept on talking, asking me about, about him. That gave me a lot of strength. And I, I feel so much comforted. So, yeah, Myrtle, you will always be my heart. And I want you to know, and I want every one of you here to know that domestic workers of the world, thank you, Myrtle. Domestic workers of the world unite. Thank you very much. Domestic workers have a convention. This is one of the many songs which uh, Matt Whitboy loved, and especially when we won. Convention 189 on decent work for domestic workers. <laughs> to whom, to whom does matter belong to? Domestic to us. Worker. To whom, to whom does matter belong to? Domestic workers. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a tribute from domestic workers, members of workers from Africa. To the late first uh, president of IDWF, but also the executive member of uh, IDWF from Africa. And we are very grateful our executive uh, member from Africa became the first president of the International Domestic Workers Federation in the world. <laughs> IDWF Africa region received the sad news of the death of Mato Ruth Delin Whitboy the General Secretary of SADAO, 
the IDWF executive representing African domestic workers and the president of the International Domestic Workers Federation on the 16th January of 2023. With a high sense of grief and profound respect, we pay this humble tribute to our lovely departed great dear leader, Mato Whitboy. Mato Whitboy, you are the founder of IDWF affiliate Tadao in South Africa, whereby you sacrifice yourself to make sure that there is a union that organizes, defends, and fights for domestic workers. The laws came like a dream and left us with no idea what to say about our loved one. The feeling is very devastating. It is most difficult to deal with the loss of a family member, a friend, a colleague, or a loved one. It is tough to accept the reality that the colleague you shared life with is gone for eternity. It is very devastating at a point like this, and words fail us to express how we feel about the ugly situation and saying many words may be impossible as grief limits the expression of our souls. These inev inevitable circumstances is made more difficult by seeing the walls of memories and being reminded of the things we have gone through together, Mato. It is more devastating to realize that all we have on this lovely colleague are our memories. Please accept our sympathy. It is heartbreaking to say farewell to you, Mato. We will miss your fearless dedication to fighting for the right. You meant a lot to African domestic workers and the IDWF and your community. Your physical presence is gone, but the lessons you taught us in the life and while courageously approaching death will save us all well for many years to come. Most of us first met you as you worked for Sadao as a general secretary in 2009. <coughs> and it was your active participation that was very useful in the formation of IDWF and the demand for the International Convention, ILO on Convention 189 for domestic workers. You mentored most domestic workers leaders on the continent and beyond on the unique challenges domestic workers face. We say you made it real. Mato, these are some of the words you used to say in your strong speeches, and you are very expert in speeches. As we grapple to come to terms with this loss, we clearly remember some of the strong words in many of your speeches where you used to say, we will move mountains with your finger up. We will move mountains. We shall leave no stone unturned, unturned until domestic workers are free from slavery. Mato, you required African domestic workers to take radical different approaches for, towards freeing themselves from oppression and exploitation and humiliation they suffered for ages at their hands of the privileged few. Mato, you were an organizer, a mobilizer, a negotiator with the government and the employers, and a mentor whom the Sadao and the IDWF had become your extended family. Mato, you had become a great speaker, the voice of the voiceless, the poor, the discriminated, and the migrant domestic really, Mato. Mato, you are the icon for domestic workers, the hero born in Africa, and we are very proud. You are the first president of IDWF from Africa, and you are such a special person to us. With your call, we gain insight into our situation, developed conventional strategies, and explored robust solutions that helped us make some bold strategic choices. We salute you. Mato, you made it real. Mato, you believed on your own. As Salim said, you were one of the most courageous people we knew. You dared life and you had created impactful projects for we members in Sadao. 
domestic workers union in the region and at the federation level. We have learned to keep our word because you had a trustworthy leader like you. No matter how we suffer the loss, you will always have a special place in our hearts. You made it real, real matter with you. You were our biggest inspiration, our role model, and our motivator. And we knew we could always count on you. And though you have gone to rest, you will remain our strength. You are the true meaning to our strength. When you went through trauma, you came out smiling. She was always smiling. You taught us we could choose to be happier no matter what. We really, we will never forget your words. When you left, you gained, we, you gained new wings. And though we are heartbroken at losing you, you were needed more in heaven. It is time for us to come together and march for the future on the path you forged for us. Mato, as we lay you to rest, we say to you, enjoy the afterlife. Mato, you have changed the world for better, and it will never be the same because you know, because of you. Mato, we love you. Rest in perfect place, Mato Ruth Whitwell. Amen. We love you, Mato Biko. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shirley Price, and I'm coming from the other side of the world, Jamaica, land we love, <laughs> only because of Myrtle. <laughs> Farewell to our loving legend, our president, our icon, my best friend, my sister, my ride and die, Merkel Whitbow. Merkel was a stalwart. You have fought for women and children, and if it was up to you, no one would be left behind. You have definitely changed the world where domestic workers are concerned. You have left us side for dignity, respect for domestic workers will forever be in our hearts. For us in the Caribbean, it has been an honor to be in this struggle with Merkel. And to know Merkel, to work with her over the years, from actions, mean marches, the conferences, to meetings, Merkel was always, always there, always showed up with full power. A soft-spoken person with a giant heart, a giant voice. You know, she could, you, you, could, you could feel her everywhere. When Merkel walked into the room, her present head, you, you have to be asking, who is that lady? Because, you know, her powerful presence, you know, you could feel it. For me, my heart is broken. It took me a while to speak. I couldn't even go on Facebook. Because when I go on Facebook, everything, it, it, it was about America. So I stopped going on Facebook because I wasn't ready to face it. 
Because I know Merkley was not well. But going so soon was a surprise to me. In my heart, I was on my way to Africa. Because um, I said, I want to come here. I want to give her the last hug. I want to just hold her hands. I want you to know that I'm just here. But when Elizabeth came back, Elizabeth said, no, you can't make it, you know. And in just a few days after that decision, you know, she was gone. I was in denial. I also know I was not prepared to face this day. Merkel last WhatsApp to me on the 8th of January saying, I love you, my sister. Take care of the workers. It must have been very hard for her to write those words, you know, because we know how weak she was. But the strength and the fighting spirit she had, you know, allow her to write those words. We have, we have not only lost a rose from our garden, but the vine that helped us to grow strong, big, and powerful. I was lucky enough to be planted beside that marigold that protected, that encourages, that helped me to grow. Because America led me to grow so powerful, so strong in my own region, and across the world, of course. She helped me to be fearless and ready to conquer all. To be, America helped me to be one of the most no-nonsense, advocate, as I am called, in, in, in my region. There's so much gain when you meet and work with someone that sees the world as you do. Miracle never left anyone behind at no time, especially me. It's no accident that in most pictures I'm standing right beside Miracle. I'm like a handbag for her. <laughs> In her voice, she would say, stand here, sit here. <laughs> we, we communicate wherever we go by the shake her head. She'll do this. I know what to do. She will give me the eye contact. I know what to do. In meetings, in the conferences, I know when to get up. I know when to stand. I know when she's ready to sing. We have. We communicated, you know, very well by just this, this body gesture, you know. And I know when to move. If I'm in a meeting and she's speaking and she wants me to say something, I know when I should say it and when I must not say it because of she will do this. And I said, okay, I'm gonna, you know, prepare myself. I'm ready to speak now, you know. <laughs> yeah, so I know the sign of what to do when and where. We spend so much time together fighting for you know, domestic workers' rights. Because we believe that respect, equality, and dignity must be everybody's business. It should be everybody's business. But few will make a lasting impression in our hearts and minds. A miracle do left an impression on all of us here. We will continue to do the work in our legacy, and we will never get tired. Miracle's light will continue to guide us in the domestic workers' movement as we propel forward in our fight for freedom, justice, and liberation. We're never going to keep us down because of Miracle. We can stand, we can shout, and we can say, Amanda! Amanda! We have paid the price, but look how much we have gained. A woman led federation for years with over a million or almost a million members. And this cannot be wrong, all because of Merkel. Merkel, you, you help us to grow big and powerful. We are now able to stand with anyone toe to toe. We were banned many times but never broken. But if ever we do bend, we will come back strong, 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 because 
We are domestic workers. We are invincible and we are strong. Merkel leaves a footprint and millions across the world. I'm committed to carry on the fight, not just a fight, but to fight and win. Merkel, my friend, my sister, my champion, well done, good and faithful servant. You have fought a good fight. Rest in eternal power. We love you. Thank you. My name is Doug Moore, and I'm the executive director of the uh, United Domestic Workers of America. It's a labor union in, Ca in California. And I want to thank the family for giving me the opportunity to pay tribute uh, to Myrtle. And you all heard it today. Myrtle's body of work has, has had a global impact on domestic workers around the world. Now, my union is located in the US in California. And it was Myrtle who convinced me that we can do more by connecting our organizations to build power for all domestic workers globally, to fight side by side, to fight side by side, uh, to win power in social and economic justice for domestic workers throughout the world. Now, Myrtle understood that the power of domestic workers is not just a union contract. Or, an employer, or employer relationships, it was also about the dignity of work, that work, domestic workers' work has dignity. And um, it was because of her that we really got engaged in the global work at UDW. Um, I'm also a member of the IDWF Exco ex Committee. And um, I share what everyone else said before me. And um, one week ago today, Myrtle was called home. She was called home. And um, for the last seven days, we've been mourning and consoling each other. But we also have to ask ourselves, what does Myrtle want us to do? What would she want us to do? And to the members of Sasawu and Kasatu, I say this. She would say, strap on your armor and fight for justice. Strap on your armor and fight against gender-based violence. Strap on your armor and continue to fight for domestic workers globally. Thank you.
but in the buffers. Struggle, forward in the struggles of buffers, forward. My name is Gloria Kente. I'm the national organizer of Satao. Uh, as I'm standing here, I am deeply saddened by the loss of comrade, my colleague, my mother, my mentor, and my role model, Metal Red Boy. I called her a mother because of the role she played in my life. She was nurturing, compassionate, caring, and comforti comforting all the time, my go-to person. I will always remember our Mondays. Every Monday, when I got in the office, Mama will say to me, how are you, Gloria? Go to the kitchen and make a cup of tea and a cup of tea for me so we can sit and pl plan for this week. She will ask me the Mondays as, the, as they always started. It was started with counseling sessions where she would ask about my weekend and I have, I, uh, how I was, Vice versa. Before she give me a load of work, after that session, there will be a load of work. And also, she will come like it's not that metal was sitting with me in her office, coming to my office and ask me, putting her hands at the back of her pocket, asking me, Comrade Gloria, what are you doing? How far are you about that case you told me about. Sometimes I forgot about it. And then I will jump and say, okay, GS, I'm very busy with that case. Don't lie to me, Gloria. You are sitting here, you are doing that. Then when she look at me, she give me another look. But she will go back to, the, off, to her office. When she come back, Boki, she will call me Boki now. First I was comrade, Gloria. Boki, you know what? I received an invitation from UWC, I receive a message to the high profile people, and I'm going with you. But I will say to the comrade, as Salim was saying here, yeah, Metal was saying to the domestic workers, nothing is preventing you, even if you are not educated. So she will say to me, if mama, the people from the university, they speak big words, and then she come to teach me this word, jargon. So that's not a big word, glory jargon. And then I will say, there you start. Then she said, you must take your dictionary with you and note down. And then when you are at home, Gloria, you look and read. What is the meaning of that? Because she don't want to leave me behind. She, yeah. So metal was a mother, was a mother to me. I, I don't have words. I don't know how to describe metal because in my life she was really my mother. But today I'm not standing here only for me. I'm standing here for Satsau because at the end on the 9th of January when I went to visit her because I was worried that this is going to be the first time I had kids and open the door of the offices without my general secretary. Then I decided to go to Platek Luf to go and sit with her. But when I entered that house, I didn't like what I saw. But she keep talking to me. If I don't understand what she was saying, I was asking Jakey, because Jakey was the one who's always with mama. She understand now how she speak, what she want to say because of her voice. She said to me, the first thing to, she said to me, Gloria, you must be strong for the domestic workers. Gloria, what do you want this year? Remember, we have all these uh, labor laws, but there is no implementation. So please, Gloria, 
you must have, what do you want? You want a meeting or what? I said, Mama, I think the meeting will be the best, the committee meeting. She said, oh, Gloria, thank you. You have to, you and Jackie, work together. This meeting must be national because I will be gone. So I thought she was just, but I saw her. She's helpless now. She's finished. But I, I still have that thing to me that metal will be healed one day. But yeah. Now, Sapsau gave me a message to say to you all, comrades, today we come together to say goodbye to the remains of an international and local icon. Keida, Mama Metal Bad Boy. Her voice will not be silent. Keida, Mama Metal will always be remembered for her courage to stand up to the oppressor in apartheid times and also to be the voice of all domestic workers who have been abused by their employers. She was always ready to walk the street, knock on the doors, sit on the park bench from Constantia Langasi Point, be in the rain, or sun, even public holidays, weekends, even her birthdays. I remember most of the, since I, I met Metal and I work with her, most of her birthdays, she never celebrate with her family, with us. She was always overseas, going to meet with the uh, 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 government or, or, or the laborers of that side in, in, in America or any country that she, 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 got, she went. Uh, Comrade Metal was already ready to serve. She was already, she always saying even to me, Gloria, when the worker come in in the office, you must have a smile on your face to make the worker to believe on you that the, the, the problem that she's facing with, you will walk with her. Show that to the worker. A comrade, comrade Metal, hard work, made the government make changes to laws. Keita Metal also championed the cause of women. And we will always be grateful for the work that our comrade, leader, president, Metal wet boy, we, we must know that we will take the spear, Satsao, and continue to fight to ensure that domestic workers are treated equally. And we also, we will always remember Comrade Metal as a unifier, a persistent builder of domestic workers organizer, organization at home and abroad, an outstanding fundraiser, and a skilled negotiation. When I'm talking about the fundraiser and a skilled negotiator, I remember during the COVID-19, Comrade Metal, when the country shut down, I think it was after two days we were locked in our houses. Comrade Metal sent a message to me and said, Gloria, I don't know. I know that the workers don't have money at this time. And I don't know how they're going to survive with their children or their families. And then she said to me, Gloria, I will check if I can do something. I will go to knock door to door, and then I will come back. Comrade Metal came back to say, Gloria, I need a list of domestic workers because there is something that is coming from IDW. She count all those organizations that help her. I want to send something to them. I want to buy something for them. And she said the other day when she received the thank you from the comrades, she read for, from us a, a, a letter that was coming from one of our members that don't know even Mr. Uh, I mean Metal, she said, Gloria, I feel like I don't know what to say because in this message, the worker asked me, Metal, can I buy a packet of biscuits for my children? 
from this money I send it to. Because she thought that if she buy a biscuit, she's wasting because the money, money is for milli milli but I said, this is not good. The domestic workers are still, are still uh, under the, uh, the pressure because if this woman was working and the, the, uh, uh, the government recognized that the domestic workers, the work that they are doing, it's a decent work. She was not going to ask me if I can buy a packet of biscuit for, for, for my grandchildren or for my, my children. Metal that boy. Thank you for lib liberating us from, uh, from oppression. Thank you for your, for your being the voice of the voiceless. Thank you for your love and dedication to us as domestic workers. We want to give a special thank you to the funders for their support. And lastly, I want to say thank you to Peter, Linda, and Jackie for sharing their mother with us. Because it was not easy, it's their mother, but they can see that they cannot have their mother because of us, because we are hanging too much on their mother. And I say it again, Jackie, thank you very much, my sister. The work that we have done, I don't think all the children can do that. Also you, Peter, me and you, we share the leftovers of the food that was cooked <laughs> at Mama Metal's house. Sometimes you get angry because she took your lunchbox and took it to Salt River to her best. I was the best organizer, but now I'm the head of the organizers. I always get this promotion, but if I'm, I've done something wrong, that is taken away from me <laughs> until I come right. I didn't say you must step on my feet, Gloria. Yeah, that is was your mother. Thank you very much, comrade. I don't know if I can stand there, comrade. I, I don't know. I can talk until, as I was telling you that, me and her, we were, I remember when we were at Kosato office, our desk was one. We're looking at each other all the time. Sometimes we close the door. We don't want Kosato, Kosato people to look at us. We are gossiping. We are talking our things, me and my general secretary. Uh, SSAU, we want to salute you. You are our leader. You will stay as our leader. Go well, comrade Mama Metal Vet Boy. Your fighting spirit will live on us. Oh, I, the words that I like from her. If I can do it, you can do it. Don't undermine yourself, domestic worker. We used to speak with our madam. We, we, if you, you're supposed to say is, we say was. But our madam can understand us. And also, I want to leave a message to Kosatu. If Kosatu house is here, because as I said, I was sharing a lot with Metal. Metal was a strong person, but deep down, she was hurt sometimes. You see that smile on her face, you think she's happy. No. Metal said, Kosatu, please, look after the domestic workers. Look after the domestic workers, because when she come, with her history with Kosatu, it makes us to think, yay, this is really a woman that supposed to lead. Really, it was not a mistake for her to lead us as domestic workers. Kosatu, please, we mustn't look for you. Come look for us now. Come look for us now. And also, the Department of Labor. If you heard that metal now is gone, and then you're gonna do as you please. Be careful. Be careful. The domestic workers are still here because metal was not metal. She was metal for domestic workers. She was fighting for domestic workers. 
Please, comrades, you must look after the domestic workers. You must work with us. We've got great ladies here. Oh, Mama Ferus. Oh, Mama Basuka, a university. They are coming from university. But when they are sitting amongst us, we feel like we've got a, a, a what you call that certificate, diploma, all that. But our mother was always uh, telling us, you've got your certificate or your diploma from the kitchen. Yes. So today, we want people like Mama, Ferus, and Brother uh, Salim, because they, they, they are not tired to knock on our door. They, they are high profiles, but they are not scared to come. And I also want to talk to one person, and then I, I'm going to step down. Uh, Dada Tony from Kosato. Because I've got all your messages, but I don't want to say to all, yes, yes. I've, she gave me all the messages for each person. Hey, Papa Joe, Papa Joe, because she called you Papa Joe. Yeah, and then she will tell me the whole story when you have that hair, everything. Yeah, and you're wearing a shorts and you're a young man. Please, please, comrade, please, what you did for Satsau, the history of Satsau, you're always there. Don't forget us, brother. We are still there in the community house. We need you. Just give us a visit and ask, are you still surviving? Yeah, because Metal trust you, trust deep down. She want to take a blanket and put you on her back when she was still alive, the way she was talking about you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Gloria and for all the others who gave their messages, I see sitting across Myrtle for all those years has paid off Gloria. <laughs> we're going to have the last round of tributes, but before that, we're going to ask Craig to come up and do a special item. The last tributes will be done by Basil Carlser, cousin and son uh, from Genadendal. We'll also have Jennifer Fish, who is known as Myrtle's white daughter and is also writing the memoirs of Myrtle. We'll have Geraldine Farmer, a sister-in-law, also speaking on behalf of the Witboy family. We'll have Matthew Johnson, the grandson of Myrtle. And last but not least, we'll have Tony Ehrenreich, who is a colleague and lifelong friend of Myrtle, who will also do a tribute. And after the tribute, because of the time, we will go directly into the sermonette and get to the last part of the service. And we're going to ask Craig to do the special song. Good afternoon, everybody. As we pay tribute um, to Auntie Myrtle today, there's one word that has been ringing throughout all the tributes and those things. It's the faith. And the example that Auntie Myrtle has left for us, I pray that myself and everybody here, when we leave, that the people that we leave behind find us faithful.
surrounded by a greater crowd of witnesses. Let us run the race, not only for the prize, but as those who've gone before us. Let us leave to those behind us the heritage of faithfulness passed on through godly lives. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the foot Fading away like the morning star, losing its light in the glorious sun. Thus did myrtle pass from this earth and its toiling. Shall she be missed, though by others succeeded, reaping the fields she in springtime has sown? Yes, but even the sower must pass from her labors. Only the truth that in life she has spoken, only the seed that on earth she has sown, these shall pass onward, fruits of the harvest, ever remembered by what she has done. A little difficult for me. Um, good morning all, I am Basil and also son to Myrtle, and I'm here on behalf of myself and Myrtle's roots. Her roots being the Michels family, though in Cape Town they like to call themselves Michaels. 
the Muggles family and the small rural Moravian mission community of Genadendal. Wessel kan jy onthou? Onthou jy nog hoe dit was? Do you remember that we had money but we were clean, we had food, respect and parents who loved and cared for us? Now this was the way in which Myrtle always started to share thoughts and feelings of the happiest times in her life. Her childhood in the house of her beloved adoptive mama and papa. Though she would never use the word adoptive whenever she spoke of her parents. In the house of these parents, her father Johannes, he was a carpenter, and Maria Michels, who cooked for the farmers on the neighboring farms, the foundation was laid for Myrtle to become such a formidable woman. But she really had no choice because she was brought up by formidable parents and in a formidable community. Yes, strong family and community values were instilled and these, some of these were respect for all. Love thy neighbor and of course then, one of her favorites, share however little you have. In later years, her love of caring and sharing led her to even take in boarders whom she knew could not always pay their dues. I'm one of them. And this is just the kind of person that Myrtle was. Growing up, she was a quiet and loving child, mostly keeping to herself and having only one close friend who came all the way from Genadendal, Auntie Carol sitting there. This is why we in Genadendal, we were really astounded to read in the Clarion and the Cape Herald, uh, some of you might remember those newspapers, that Myrtle was this very vocal activist for the rights of the much abused domestic workers and we could not believe this, was this the same quiet Myrtle from our village? And like so many of her trade union peers, Myrtle led a sacrificial life, sacrificing a home and a personal life, and all for one thing, the cause. During the times when Myrtle became despondent and disillusioned, when things would just not go the right way, I would ask her, Myrtle, but why do you keep on doing these things? And her answer always remained the same, Basil? The workers, they are being blatantly exploited. And you know what? The powers that be, they are not helping. So I have to, my conscience. During her last months, she was adamant that the struggle for the rights of the workers, and especially the domestic workers, should be taken forward. And I think we all have a shared responsibility to adhere to her wish. Concluding. I've mentioned the happiest times of a life with a beloved mama and papa. But whenever Myrtle spoke about the beloved mama and papa, she had that far off look in her eyes. Now I can say, finally, she's back where she belongs, with her beloved mama and papa. And now, finally, she is at peace. Rest well, Myrtle. Thank you. Hello, it's such an honor to be here. I feel a part of the South African family for 22 years now. But I actually wasn't initially welcomed by Myrtle. I was one of those researchers like Feruz, and I walked into her office and I said, I'd like to have an interview with you. And she had this incredible nonverbal communication, surely with her looks and her gestures, and she looked at me and she said no. She said, if you want to understand our lives, come and work with us and support our movement before you drain our brains. <laughs> so I tried. And in marches and protests and long drives, I listened to her that first year. Myrtle soon became the activist teacher of my life. More importantly, we developed a sacred friendship that I now call family. Today, as we honor this revolutionary woman, let us reflect upon what she endured and those who strengthen her core spirit. I have had a few interviews with her since that day, and I have hundreds of pages of her voice. And so today I select a few as well. Four years ago, her son Peter said, it's not about what my mother achieved, it's about what she overcame. And I ask you to think today about Myrtle's life under apartheid. 
while she faced so many losses building a radical movement. She had to leave her first child, Jackie, behind when Jackie was just one month old because her employer insisted that she care for the, the family at her work. And as we all mourn today, let us remember that when Myrtle's parents died, she had only two days to bury them and drive back and forth to her home because her employer needed her to work. When her marriage ended and she became a single mother, she would always tell me, but I found a song by Gloria Gaynor, I will survive. Tell your students, they will survive. It was that unshakable determination and daily commitment to never give up. Like so many of you here, I want to give thanks to the family. I would ask Myrtle over the years, what's it like to be famous? She's pretty famous around the world now. And I so love this quote. Here's what she said five years ago. If my children didn't allow me this freedom, if my eldest daughter didn't say, I will take over and I will see to the two younger ones while you go out there and fight, I wouldn't be here. They played the biggest role in where I am today. Jackie. Linda. <laughs> Peter, Wayne. In the last months of her life, I had the great privilege of living alongside the family. And I wanted to say today that they absolutely embodied the core values of dignity and care at the foundation of the movement Myrtle led. And thank you so much to the family for sharing your mom with us as we hung on, Gloria. <clears throat> Myrtle had so many great transferable lessons. And I witnessed her as this living example of justice and compassion. She became the model of the best of humanity for me and my students and activists and world leaders. So Myrtle and I started a life project three years ago. We wanted to write her biography and her life story. And in the last months, I kept asking her, please help me with a title. Please give me a good title. And we haven't gotten there yet. But I wanted to share some expressions that she really held core to her life. And she wanted workers to read these and embody these in their own lives. She would say, nothing is impossible. You must think in a positive way, always. Don't let sorry make you a prisoner. Never let sorry take over your life. And you must always be a vision of hope. Myrtle left this earth on the day that we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King in the United States. In one of our talks, she recommended, quote, I saw Martin Luther King in the topic of, I had a dream, and I thought, that is so true, eh? You had a dream, but you never thought this. She was so humble. And she felt incredibly grateful that she got to see so many tangible examples of the arc of humanity bending toward justice during her life, as Dr. King would say. You all know that Myrtle had a way of coming to the stage and using the platforms to persuade and to nudge and to tap power holders on the shoulder. She challenged so many leaders, and I have recollections of her both here in 2001 in South Africa fighting for the Unemployment Insurance Fund and also at the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland. And both times she said to leaders, you wouldn't be here if someone didn't iron your shirt today. So think of the domestic workers when you vote. And in the spirit of reference to Kasatu in our last conversations, I think about Myrtle on her 75th birthday just four months ago. And during her speech in Community House, she reminded Kasatu leaders that it was the 45,000 domestic workers who founded the movement. And she asked about the meaning of contemporary solidarity. We cannot begin to grasp the gravity of this loss. Most of us still sit in shock at the moment. I had the great honor of corresponding with the press to share Myrtle's obituary, and a woman here in Cape Town said, she's just so iconic. We thought she'd always be around like Table Mountain. And today I want to recognize so many leaders in the struggle who are leaving us, who shared and shaped who Myrtle had become for all of us. Our greatest offering is to try to reciprocate the benevolence that she gave us, to try to take action in your lives in ways that model Myrtle while it's at want. She thought about the domestic workers, and their care was the very last request of her life on the day that she transitioned. In our last communications about a week prior, I shared a reflection on death by Talia Hunter, who wrote, take the image you have of me in your mind and allow it to fuel you to take action. Seize the day and be reminded of what is most important in life. And Myrtle's last message to me was, I just love that. 
So today, I ask you to consider how you will honor Myrtle, not only in memory, but in action. What is your stage, and where will you use the influence of her voice to lead a better world? As each of us do so in our own forms, we will collectively move a little closer to the world that she envisioned, the struggles she so bravely led, and the love she, she so genuinely embodied for all of us. Viva Mama Myrtle. A few days uh, actually, I think it was about two days after Myrtle, Myrtle passed, I spoke with um, Peter and Jackie, and uh, they asked me to say something, and uh, maybe to sing as well, and I said, oh, I, sure, I'll do that, and I said, for my mercy, and Peter, as usual, put me in my place. He said, oh, she was everybody's mercy. <laughs> so what we've heard today is evidence of that. Everybody's mercy, not just mine. I'm honored to have the opportunity to publicly pay tribute to my amazing sister-in-law, Myrtle Goodboy. She came into my life when I was just 14 years old, and that's nearly 50 years ago now, and quickly filled a really huge part of my heart. She went from being a new big sister to someone I loved and admired greatly. When I was 15, I remember that Myrtle, heavily pregnant at the time, came through to Langabarn from Cape Town with her husband, my brother, to where our, our family was camping, newspaper in hand, to bring me exam results. Those of you who are old enough will know that in those days, you got junior certificate and senior certificate results in the newspaper. For some, they only claim to fame. Um, she was as excited at my success as I was, and a few days later, she gave birth, and I was allowed to name the baby. Linda, now you know, it's my fault. <laughs> the unassuming, easy congeniality, uh, which I first encountered, hid a steely determination and a raging passion to correct injustice and call out those who are meeting it out. At first, as a teenager, not very worldly wise, I found it difficult to, in my ignorance, to reconcile the soft-spoken, gentle, easygoing, smiling Myrtle who could cook up a storm with my growing awareness of Myrtle, the activist, who was often in the news and sometimes, according to my mother, now before I say the next thing, I need to just say that today my mother would have been 104 years old, so please put it in perspective. <laughs> um, sometimes, according to my mother, causing trouble, and being in trouble with the white people again. Over the years, I have seen Myrtle embody the sentiment of Psalm 82 verse 3, which implores us, and I paraphrase, to vindicate the weak, to stand up for justice, and to maintain the rights of the afflicted. Myrtle's unrelenting quest for justice, fairness, to for those unable to speak, sometimes at great cost to herself, reminds me also of a quote by Martin Luther King. There's nothing more majestic than the determined courage of an individual willing to suffer and sacrifice for their freedom and dignity. Her unwavering love and care for the plight of domestic workers was rivaled only by her fierce devotion to her family, and especially her bookies, as she called them, her grandchildren, Matthew, Caleb, and Mia. Speaking to some of my family members about Myrtle, a constant sentiment was that she was not a sister-in-law. She was a sister. Myrtle, despite her busy schedule, was always willing to help out. As a young mother, I, on more than one occasion, was able to rely on Myrtle for babysitting or just for a quiet chat when things were going rough. Myrtle and her family very kindly, years later, took my daughter and her son in for a short while. And a memory that stands out for her is that 
when on the second night of being in a, in a home, young Samuel, my grandson, uh, wouldn't settle, and she was getting anxious about it. Myrtle simply came into her room, sat herself down, and cradled the cranky baby until he fell asleep. Problem solved. Needless to say, she fully embraced our family, and our strict and sometimes difficult mummy was her mummy too. No question, for better or for worse. My mother loved her too, like a daughter, and couldn't understand, I should say but couldn't understand, in the early days, why she would work for no pay. And she was always worried that she was going to get in trouble. And did she? Few people, few people will leave behind them a legacy such as that of Myrtle. Not of silver or gold or houses or lands, but in the strength of character, perseverance, and an unwavering sense of purpose, courage to act upon the strength of her convictions, sometimes against all odds. This is what I most admired and admire about her. This is something that I would like to continue to emulate, the courage to forge a new path, travel, go on the road less traveled, the one that ultimately would be the catalyst for changing the world. Not for vain glory or for recognition, but to speak for those who feel ill-equipped to speak for themselves. The late Helen Keller said, is said to have penned the words, life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all. No one alive today can say that the life of Myrtle was nothing at all. Therefore, I would like to propose that the life of Myrtle near Michaels, Michaels, with her humble beginnings and many ups and downs, has indeed been a daring adventure, the full consequence of which we are yet to see. Myrtle, I salute you and what you have stood for until your dying breath. Your life has meant much to so many. I value your spirit and legacy and pray that it will continue to pervade the high places and the low places of this country and the world. You live on in our hearts. Until then. Hello, everyone. Um, I know we're all here today to give tribute to a woman who has done so much for so many in her life. And you cannot, like my dad said, encapsulate all of that into a single service or a few words. But today, I thought I should give you all a short bit of what it was like from the perspective of her grandchildren. You all knew her as Myrtle, Auntie Myrtle, or Comrade Myrtle, but I knew her as Granny. I can't remember a time without my Granny in my life, which is strange, because we, cause she never actually lived with us. Granted, I'm sure I saw her the, almost the, every day for the first three years of my life, but of course, I don't really rem remember much of that. And then we moved away, first to Port Alfred, then to Qatar, and then to the Netherlands. But each step of the way, I felt like I had her with me. And our communication was constant. Whether it be through phone calls or FaceTimes, my granny always made time to hear from us. One of my favorite memories I have of my granny is that the first time she, is the first time she came to surprise us. And this was when we were very young, but we were living in the Netherlands already. She's a, she surprised us again this year, but the first time I will never forget. My brother and I had just arrived back from school, and we entered the lounge, and there she was sitting on the couch. Immediately, my entire day got better. I ran to hug her, and I couldn't wait for all the time I'd be able to spend with her for the next week or so. Because that's what my granny did. She went out of her way to make me and my brother happier, and there's nothing more we could ever ask for. I remember all the times she took my brother and I on walks, and she'd tell us about her long and fascinating life. She'd tell us of her work, and about all the people she's met and the people she's helped, and we'd be in awe. When I'd go back to school the next day, I'd brag to everyone, telling them how cool my granny was. I also remember the time she would tell me to stop stressing about the things I can't control, because I did a lot of that. 
give me, and she would give me advice and tell me it's going to be okay. A lot of my motivation for everything I've done so far has come from her and the constant support which she has given me throughout my life. I was so fortunate to see her again this year, two times in fact, which is more than usual. But these last few months were difficult. It was hard to see her in the state she was in. But I'm sure everyone here knows that she would never let us feel sorry for her. She would always tell me to look on the bright side, to stop worrying, and to remember and cherish the times we've had with her. I just wanted to share this with all of you, the effort my granny made to love and to care for her grandchildren. Her love is something I will always keep with me, and I'm sure my brother and Mia can say the same. Granny, I know that you'll be proud of everything and anything Amanda! Amanda! Long live the spirit of Comrade Myrtle Witboy. Long live. Comrade Myrtle, I come here today to bring you the warmest greetings, the love and support of millions of Kusatu members across the length and breadth of our country who knew you by your heart and by your actions. Because words are not enough to change a world. It takes concerted action and the ability to inspire a people to move towards change and to making things better. And so that's the message and the inspiration that millions of workers in this country take from the life, the legacy, and the example of Comrade Myrtle. Comrade Myrtle, you were a domestic worker. You were a mother. You were a unionist, you were a leader of our organization, and in all of those roles, you have exemplified the best nature of our people. Those characteristics that was held most eloquently by the leaders who have gone before many of those who today don't serve us with as much glory. But Comrade Myrtle, you are amongst those leaders without any ambiguity, who kept alive the spirit, the soul, and the desire for a better life within all of our people. We came to know Comrade Myrtle through a life of activism in the struggle against the party. And it is often said that in noble struggles against great injustices, great leaders are crafted and born. But it should equally be said to be most fitting to the life and the legacy that Comrade Myrtle leaves to us that it is those great leaders created out of the hardships of struggle who serve us in the best ways. And that is why I think it is opportune to say that Comrade Myrtle exemplified those values of a servant leadership. She never came to leadership for the perks of high office and the financial rewards that go with it. She came to leadership out of a desire to serve our people and to make sure that this promise of a better life that we've held up for all of our people, that that is rolled out to all of our people, not only a few within our country. And so today, Comrade Myrtle, as we come to celebrate your life, we do that with a heavy heart. Colleagues before me spoke about grief, and today everybody who I've encountered have spoken about their grief for the great loss of Comrade Myrtle's life, and her contribution towards that. 
But as we look to find a place for our grief, to find a place for our love, to land that we had for Myrtle, we also know that today, more than any time, we must come together to celebrate an amazing life. A life of honor, a life of service, and a life that's inspired our people. So today, Comrade Myrtle, even though our hearts are heavy, we want to thank you for all that you've done for us. We want to take the special moment to thank your family because you've, say, you've shared your mother with you, as many other comrades have said before me, and that is always not understood and is sometimes difficult for families. But the advantage of looking back with hindsight is you can now look with great pride at the incredible contribution your mother has made, not only to domestic workers, but to our country and the kind of path and ambition that it set for itself. But we also come together as comrades, because we know that when we come together as comrades and we share our solidarity, that is in keeping with the time-honored slogan of our people who spoke about an injury to one is an injury to all, and a loss to one is a loss to all of our people. And so today we don't just honor you, we salute you, your family, your comrades, and all who have gone before you. The most amazing thing about the contributions today is that all of the testimonies to Comrade Myrtle's life tells of a life well lived, a life lived in service of our people. And if anything, it reaffirms that maxim that says we have to believe in something greater than ourselves. There must be something that we strive for that gives our life meaning and purpose. And so we all try to find the best in life for ourselves, but it is also important to make a contribution to the public good so that we can align ourselves and stand in solidarity with those who spent their lives in pursuit of the public good. So Comrade Myrtle, we take from your lessons the one important slogan that will stand up for all of us, and that is that every injustice that is committed and that we are aware of, we have to confront. And it was Comrade Myrtle whose life is a legacy to confronting those injustices whether it's the injustice of race discrimination, the horrors of class exploitation, or the oppression of women's subjugation. These are amongst the cornerstones that Comrade Myrtle brought into our lives and what we must continue to build on if we are to honor her legacy and make sure that all of the things that she does has resonance in a South Africa trying to find itself. Comrade Myrtle, when we talk about you, we talk about love personified. And it's in the keeping of those great revolutionaries like Che Guevara who spoke about the fact that the true measure of a revolutionary is how he's guided by his love for his people or for her people. And that's what we called upon to do. That's what we've got to do to make things better because if we can take any lesson from all of our encounters with Comrade Myrtle, it is that her life and the guidance that she shared in so many ways, that that is an amazing roadblock, a roadmap to a life that can be lived in betterment of our society. So with all of the ambitions that we have as South Africans, we want to make sure that that sacred promise that we made to our people about realizing the Freedom Charter that spoke through all the challenges that exist, that that continues to be the rallying slogan that brings us together. But Comrade Myrtle, as we speak to you today, we must tell you that it is your lessons that will endure with us most. And those lessons are clearly guided. You were clearly directed by clear values and principles and your love of God and how that manifested itself in making sure that you constantly work at bringing about greater social justice. Because Martin Luther King said it, Barack Obama said it, but all of us has an obligation to ensure that the trajectory of life arcs towards greater social justice. Myrtle had achieved that in her life, and it's upon us to make sure that we're able to take that forward. The struggles against gender equality, the horrors with which women are still treated in our country, is an issue that we must all take forward with the same vigor that Myrtle has. Because we can never realize the ambition of a liberated people if the oppression that is meted out to women and the violence that is meted out to women still continues under our watch. And so that's become an important issue 
that we must take up. But the matter for which Myrtle has been known most obviously is a struggle to ensure that we can achieve workers' rights. Not only workers' rights in South Africa, but she's become a champion and a leader of the sustainment and the attainment of workers' rights to all domestic workers in the world. And this is an important achievement, and this is an important struggle. Because as key as 1994 was to the lives of all South Africans, the point that Myrtle makes is essential. It is not enough to have a great constitution, not enough to have the wonderful promises. We must change our people's lives where they find itself and make sure that all of our people have the rights, the privileges that we promised them in the Freedom Charter and that's enshrined in the constitution. And that's the kind of life that Myrtle calls us to ensure that we are able to achieve. And it's this question of 1994 and what it represents to our people because Myrtle was also a leader and a champion in the anti-apartheid movement of making sure that we build a better life for all of our people, for undoing the horrors of apartheid. Because remember where domestic workers and their lack of rights and the low wages come from. It has its origins in the most horrendous exploitative measures of apartheid. And so we can't deal with the legacy and the hardships that apartheid visit on our people without confronting the exclusion of domestic workers and many other categories of workers from labor rights and proper conditions of employment. And Myrtle was able to achieve that in her life. But that meant you had to be able to read the politics of the time. You had to be able to accept that we don't have Uhuru yet. We don't have this grand freedom. And what's going to happen after 1994 is that we'll all have to buckle down and make sure that we build this freedom that we promised ourselves in the Freedom Charter and in our Constitution. But that takes hard work. And that's the hard work that Myrtle dedicated our lives to. Because if we don't do the hard work, the scallums that we see taking over our politics, enriching themselves and filling their pockets at the cost of our people will steal our democracy. So the legacy of Myrtle is as much a defense of the dreams and ambitions of all of our people in what a South Africa can represent for all of the people that desires those opportunities that we spoke about. Comrade Myrtle, nobody can talk about you or think about you without being moved in a very deep and personal way. Because the comrades had made the point, yours was not just the transactional engagement with members and comrades you encountered. Anybody who encountered Myrtle felt the love that she had for people and the love that she had for justice and a better world for all of our people. And that's got to be what grabs us at our souls and make sure that we hold that close and take that forward. Comrade Myrtle, your voice and your footsteps will forever ring in the halls of power in South Africa and across the world because you engage those in powerful positions and you reminded them about what power is meant to achieve. It's, about, it's meant to make things better for those who are the most marginalized. And it's not an opportunity for those who are powerful or in powerful positions to enrich themselves through corrupt practices and others. And the one thing that she spoke out more harshly was the scans of corruption that's tearing apart our country and stealing the hopes and dreams of our children. And so our struggle to build this better world is about fighting against those triple oppressions of race, class, and gender exploitation but it's also about confronting the horrors of corruption that in the main steals from poor people. So when we come together today, it's to remind ourselves about this roadmap that you've helped us to carve and that should be directing us into the future. And now is the time that we must come together and not only thank you for your life, thank you for your contribution, but let you know in no uncertain terms that we loved who you were, we loved what you did, and we pledge to continue taking that forward. And so, Comrade Myrtle, as you continue to visit yourself on us in different ways, whether that's in our hearts or in the halls of community house late at night when people are coming from a meeting, we know that you'll be there with us, continuing to inspire and encourage us to do the right thing. 
We come here today to say goodbye. But we come here today to pledge that we will pick up the sword that you have laid down. And with that spear, we will make sure that we realize all of the ambitions and the sacred promises that we'd made to our people in the Freedom Charter. This land must be shared by all of its people. The wealth of this country must be shared by all of its people. There must be security and comfort for all of its people. Those are the challenges that lie ahead of us. Those are the challenges that we are called upon to honor if we honor all that Comrade Myrtle was and all that she meant to us. Hamba Kashle, Comrade Myrtle, rest well. You've run a good race, and thank you for your contribution. Viva Myrtle Witboy, viva! Thank you very much. Friends, the previous speaker was mentioning some of the social evils, and I didn't realize that he's also guilty. He stole my thoughts. <laughs> and the singer stole my thoughts. And so, uh, people, I'm not going to uh, repeat that again, okay? We've, we are tired now, uh, but this is one little point I want to make. You know, Jesus and John the Baptist <clears throat> were contemporaries they had the same mission, relieving the poor, uh, giving hope to people who, were, who felt themselves hopeless. And uh, they, there was no chance of them uh, extricating themselves out of this pit that had been built for them by those in authority. And uh, they were condemned to this life because it's the sins of your family. It's your ancestry, and you had to perform a whole lot of um, rituals that uh, were very expensive, and so if you didn't have the money, there's no way of you getting out of it. And, and so they worked together, and uh, Jesus and John seemed to have had a little bit of a um, conflict, you know, and uh, John ends up in prison, and while you're in prison, you start thinking, you know, uh, and I imagine that even uh, Myrtle, in her prison of sickness, on her, on her deathbed, must have had lots of thoughts going through her mind. It, was my mission really successful? Uh, was it really worth it? And, um, and so John was feeling bad, and he sends his disciples to Jesus. Tell me, man, are you the Messiah? Huh? Or are we waiting for someone else? And then, of course, the stories, you know, the social media. They, they had their own social media those days. The stories were coming back to John. This man is eating with sinners. He's eating with, with, uh, with, with, with the dropouts of society. Uh, he, he's, he's mixing with the publicans and the prostitutes. And uh, Jesus was reaching out to people. And so the disciples, uh, John's disciples, come to Jesus and say, tell me, uh, John wants to know, are you the Messiah? And Jesus knew what was behind their thinking. And he turned around, he, he didn't answer them. And uh, before he could even answer them, there were people coming to him. And he was healing the sick. He was uh, uh, helping to uh, uh, people who were destitute and uh, really, uh, people were just coming to him, and he was serving them. And so he said to the disciples of John, you go and tell John what you have seen. And when John heard of what Jesus was seeing, he knew that he was 
in the right mission. He, he was in the right place. Friends, to cut the long story short, Myrtle, during the last few months, has been in prison. And I have no doubt that the devil was there to question her about her mission. She's getting ready now to settle, uh, to mend her relationship with God, if there was any mending to do, confessing her sins, and getting ready to meet her maker. And, uh, and you know, she needed some affirmation. What am I, what I've done, has it really worked? It's not so much, and the success of her mission is not so much what she has done, well, partly because of what she has done, but has the ideas that we have, the, uh, the, the people's minds changing towards the destitute, have we been successful? Have people really... Um, grabbed onto the idea that the poor are in fact made in the image of God and that they are important. And today I just want to leave you with this. I'm cutting short. I'm trying to get on with uh, condensing a few pages. I want you to imagine Myrtle going through this crowd and she's standing in front of you. She wants to know, has my mission been successful? And she speaks to you personally. Could you, like Jesus, say, I'm not going to answer you, but look what I'm doing. I'm feeding the poor. I have concern about those who are less fortunate. I am doing, I'm not promising you. Jesus didn't promise John the Baptist that this is what he's going to do from now on. He was doing it. Are you, in fact, at this moment, is your life exemplary? And are you doing something in your small corner to make our country a better place? Friends, this is the challenge we have. Because we're going to leave here and we're just going to say, ah, I've been to a funeral. Uh, yes, that Myrtle, yeah, she passed away, you know. Uh, nice lady, you know. Yeah, hey, she worked, she worked for the domestic workers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But meanwhile, you are ill-treating your own domestic worker. You are doing things that you shouldn't be doing. And for the men, you are the one that's clapping your wife. You are abusing your children. Friends, Myrtle is no more, but she leaves with us her, her legacy. Are we going to really adopt it and it's going to be part of our lives? And this is what we have to deal with here today. And I want to leave you with this. Because, you know, um, when summing it up in, in Matthew, it speaks there that when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him. And all oh, friends, we look forward to that time when Jesus is going to come. But the criteria whereby we are going to see salvation or not is given to us in this way. And it says, when I was hungry, did you give me something to eat? When I was thirsty, did you give me something to drink? When I was a stranger, did you invite me in? When I needed clothes, did you clothe me? When I was sick, did you look after me? When I was in prison, did you visit me? Oh, friends, this is the challenge we have today. Are you doing these little things in your own way? We're not asking you to form international organizations. God anointed Myrtle to do that. And uh, oh, it's absolutely wonderful how this humble girl from a little village uh, came onto the world stage. 
She was anointed by God to do that. But now we are talking to ourselves. You in your small corner and I in mine. Are we doing what we know we should be doing? And so, friends, I, uh, I wish to uh, thank the Lord for Myrtle. But now we must adopt her legacy also into our own lives. And um, to her colleagues and friends of Myrtle, uh, you work together. I thank you for the work you're doing. Yes, South Africa is a better place. We've started something. Let's build on that and let's do something. And I pray, friends, those friends and colleagues of Myrtle, may the devil never divert or capture the true purpose for your existence. People must always be important, not the organization, not the power struggles within the organization. And I tell you, you know, even Jesus and his disciples had problems. There were power struggles. And Jesus had to tell them, you know, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And uh, I pray that the Lord will continue to bless you. There's a lot of work to be done. Lots and lots of work, not only in South Africa, but all around the world. I'm going to ask the family of uh, our dear sister to come uh, around the, the coffin. And we're going to uh, say our fond farewells to her. Uh, you know that she will uh, be cremated probably tomorrow or in a few days' time. And we want to commit her body to the Lord Will all the family, will her siblings also come to the front and gather around the coffin? Can I? Myrtle was no doubt a great lady. And um, I think at the door I met uh, one of her brothers, you know, and I'm so happy for what you have told us about her background. Uh, I, I recognize that there was, she comes from good. That is why she is good. Uh, thank you so much. She was a great lady, a great woman, and she cast a great an uh, even great, bigger shadow of influence than uh, we can imagine. And um, she had friends and workmates around the world, but uh, to her children and grandchildren, uh, your phone calls, I understand, were the phone calls that she treasured most uh, because you were important to her. And her legacy to you is thinking beyond yourself, outside of your own needs. And I pray that love will begin at home. Are you kind to each other? Are we caring for each other? It's no use trying to help the neighbor when we're not even helping one another at home. And so I pray that her legacy starts at home and that you will check on each other. And friends, uh, the most important thing that Myrtle has left us with, we do not necessarily have to have lots of money and education to, uh, to be a blessing. Uh, yes, please get yourselves educated. I want none of you to drop out of school. Uh, uh, do your best, and no matter where you go, I don't know where the Lord is going to lead you. Some of you may become directors of corporations. We hope so. But will you never forget the legacy of our dear uh, sister, yeah, who showed us that love must come first.
I read to you from 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14 to 18. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We are sad. I have no doubt that you are sad. This was a wonderful lady, a wonderful mother, a wonderful grandmother. And you are going to miss her. But there's coming a day, very shortly, when Jesus is going to come. And we look forward to that, where we'll be reunited with our loved ones. And so for everything, there is a season and a time for every matter. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. And as we prepare to leave this building, let us entrust Myrtle Woodboy's body to the earth from which she came. All life is formed of the earth and returns to the bosom of Mother Nature, earth to earth, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. We commend Myrtle Whitboy and the memory we have of her to this ceaseless round, knowing that in time we too shall join the circle. But we have the certain hope of the resurrection. When God shall return in glory, this body of humiliation shall be changed and made like unto his glorious body. Let us bow our heads as we pray. Father, this is <clears throat> a very sad occasion, which we say our fond farewells to Myrtle. Lord, we have children who are going to miss a mother. We have grandchildren who are going to miss a grandmother. There's family members who loved, who love this dear soul. Father, come close to them at this time. May they feel your arms of love about them, assuring them that soon and very soon we will see the king. There'll be no more dying there. There'll be no more crying there. Oh, Lord, we look forward to that occasion. Be with the family, Lord. And Father, we think of all the others here who work associates. May they also desire to one day to meet Myrtle again, where we will spend the ceaseless ages of eternity with our, with our maker, and in which there will be no pain, no more crying. Keep us faithful until that glorious occasion. This is our prayer in the loving name of Jesus, and for his sake, amen. You may take your seats.
We will now leave the church, and I'm going to invite the following people who will be the pallbearers for the coffin as it leaves the church, Uncle Joseph, Uncle Brian, Uncle Vivian, Nina, Robin, and Esme. If you can come to the front and stand next to the coffin as it moves out. And uh, if we can ask the pianist to come, and as we exit, we can sing the song, It Is Well With My Soul. The family will follow behind, and everyone else will follow. The coffin will go into the hearse, and it will be taken uh, away. And we invite you to, as it is going out, that maybe we form a guard of honor uh, for those who want to, to join in that. And then following that, in the hall next door, we will have some refreshments and time together with the family. Shall we stand? South Africa's deep apartheid divides, Myrtle Witboy's first organizing work took place in private homes. At an early age, she saw the impact of injustice without representation. 
1967, South Africa was still in the grip of apartheid and domestic workers was actually just depending on women. And because women were majority black women, uneducated, we found ourselves as domestic workers. She began to organize domestic workers in her employer's garage, an act of resistance worthy of imprisonment at the time. Her voice became one of the first public figures to campaign for the rights for this isolated group of women workers. Myrtle organized South Africa's National Union of Domestic Workers, the largest movement of its kind. Make sure that domestic workers are included in your decisions making in your country. Make sure that domestic workers get recognition that their work is decent work. In the new democracy, she posed hard questions to government leaders who ironed the shirt that day, who looked after their children, who cleaned their homes. Challenges that led to the adoption of five national labor laws, including unemployment insurance and maternity benefits. In 2008, Myrtle's impact multiplied as she became the president of the first international organization of domestic workers which played a powerful role in achieving the only global policy for domestic workers, the International Labour Organization's Convention 189, now ratified by 35 countries. Under the global COVID crisis, she led an international process that secured crisis relief funds for domestic workers, literally saving lives and reducing the impact of this virus amongst those on the front lines of care. Myrtle Witboy's life commitment to domestic workers and women's rights has made immeasurable impact around the world in both tangible policy and economic forms and is a magnanimous emblem of social justice worldwide. Her commitment to domestic workers inscribes the highest calling of life achievement as a direct service to justice, peace and solidarity. Domestic workers work isolated from other workers. They actually live alone, they stay in the backyard of the employers. Also, domestic workers are not really protected with social security and social benefits. So that is actually why they're still called a vulnerable sector. But we are hoping that changes will come for the domestic workers.